Welcome to the News House. I'm Claire Miller, and today I'm here with award-winning author and Syracuse professor George Saunders. Professor Saunders, thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. Very nice to be with you. I'd like to start at the beginning before you even became a writer. Mm. Um, you worked a variety of jobs from a roofer to a geophysicist. Yes. So how did those experiences contribute to your development as a writer? And do you think that people need to be exposed to how things work in order to write about them right. well? Right. Well, to your second question, I think probably not. In other words, I, it, it, in the program we get students who have never done that stuff and they're just brilliant. You know, or you can look at Flannery O'Connor who really did never do any other kind of work. But for me, it was really important because as it turned out, my, my subject really is class. I think that's one of the big subjects. And getting out and doing that work was really um, important in clarifying what I thought about America. You know, so you go and do a roofing job and you find out that it's really miserable and hard. And uh, it kind of cuts into your grace. You know, at the end of the day, you're tired. That's kind of an interesting thing for a writer to know. Uh, so for me, the main benefit was just that it, it kind of um, got rid of a lot of BS ideas I had about America. Like in America, all you have to do is try hard and you'll succeed. And you could see in those jobs that wasn't actually true. People were working really hard. And the system and sometimes the work itself was uh, working against them in a way. So it complicated, actually it had the long-term effect of complicating my political understanding of our country, which was all to the good. Yeah. And when you were first starting out as a writer, how important was it for you to be published or to have an audience actually read your work? It was really important and it really wasn't happening. Mm -hmm. So that was a good lesson because the, uh, weirdly, the publishing world is kind of just. There's a kind of a justice in it. So if you're writing something that's boring or is somehow not right, the, the world would just go, no thanks, you know? And for me, it all, I, uh, when I wrote my first good story, the whole thing lit up and it was easily published. So I think it's very natural for a young writer to want to be published because you're, you know, you, you didn't go to law school, you don't have a real job, you're, you've declared yourself a writer in a culture that doesn't really value writing that much anymore. So there you are, and you are getting pressure from friends and family, maybe family more than friends, when are you going to have a real job? So you're looking for some kind of validation. Public publishing is one way to do it. Uh, but with our students, I try to encourage them to wait just a bit, because the way the publishing world is set up now, you kind of want to come through the door big the first time. That, that's the, the time in your career when the world is going to pay the most attention is when you have your first book. So I always say just be as patient as you can. Make sure that you've um, kind of really explored your talent and got it at its highest peak and then go through the door. Uh, so I, I think it's something you have to wrestle with. You know, to publish too soon doesn't help anybody. Um, but also, on the other hand, I've had students who were very, uh, it's almost like they loved writing so much they didn't even want to try because if they tried, they might fail and then they'd have to quit. So with those students, it's a different thing, which is to say, basically, look, I know you. You've been ambitious since you were in kindergarten. And they always go, well, yeah. And then you go, it's OK. That, that energy of ambition is not, as we're often taught, a bad thing. It's actually a good thing. So you have to kind of, with those people, you have to encourage them to bless their own ambition and recognize that if they don't, you know, if they, um, for whatever complex psychological reason, they don't try their best or they don't send out stories or they don't, um, that unhappiness might not come back to them for many years. But I think if we have some kind of dream or some kind of aspiration, uh, we have a real serious responsibility, not only to ourselves, but to our future families, you know, to act on it joyfully and try to uh, get something done. If you don't, it's fine. And I know a lot of people who have tried and haven't done it, they're happy because they've tried. So it's kind of different challenges with different students, you know. And I've read that early in your career as a writer, you struggled to find your voice. Well, yeah. I wonder when it was that you finally felt you found that voice and how you attained it. Yeah, it, I can almost name the day. It was, we had, uh, we'd been through this program. My wife and I were married. We had two kids and we were really broke. And um, I just had this one, I'd written a 700-page uh, novel that was very stiff and was not at all in my voice. It was trying to be, trying too hard to be literary in a way that I can't. And uh, I was at work, and I just was writing these little poems for fun. I was in a conference call. Shouldn't have been doing it. You know, just writing these little naughty kind of scatological poems. And when I finished one, I'd, write, I'd draw a little cartoon and then just flip it over. Just boredom, you know. 
But in that state, I wasn't thinking about it. I wasn't thinking I was a, a writer. I was just farting around, basically. And um, when I brought those home, my wife loved them. She, you know, she laughed aloud, and this is what you should be doing. So something about that, it was, it was not a gradual process. It was just in that minute where I thought, oh my God, all these years, I've been so serious about writing that I haven't let any fun into it. And in real life, I'm all, I mean, if I get uncomfortable, I joke. If I get in trouble, I joke. You know, it's always humor. So it was just that moment of realizing that if you're going to be an artist, um, you are really going to have to use everything you have, even the parts of yourself that maybe you don't like or you don't think are artistic. Uh, if you're going to write a 300-page book, you're really going to have to use everything that you have, uh, including the parts of yourself that you're a little iffy about. So that was really it. And then the next day, literally, I went in, and all that had happened was a switch got thrown, and I said basically to myself, humor is OK. Go ahead and be funny which is a way of saying, go ahead and um, be willing to engage your reader in a lively conversation. You know, instead of treating her as somebody who has to sit here and take your wisdom, you know, that sort of static thing, you're saying, no, no, she's a friend, and let's talk together the way I would talk to a person, which would, would be to keep her in mind, essentially. You know? So that happened literally overnight, and it never, that was back in uh, 1990 or something, and it's never reverted. I always just, when I sit down, I just try to remember that there's, a human being on the other side of the equation who's just as smart as I am, smarter actually, better traveled, more kind, more witty, and then I'm just trying to impress her somehow like that. And now that you have had enormous success as a writer, um, I've read that you still don't really feel like you've arrived, so to right. speak. Um, most people would kind of say that you've had an amazing career already. But They're wrong. <laughs> no, no. How do you describe success? I, I think, you know, in a way, you, as I said, you sort of have to work with what you have. So I've noticed this. I have a very kind of a, I would say basically kind of a low self-esteem, maybe from being a Chicago Catholic, you know. Uh, that's useful, actually. When you're writing something, it's useful to not think too highly of yourself because then you work harder. Mm -hmm. uh, at other times, there's, I also have a part of myself that's sort of very prideful about writing that can sometimes be useful to, you know. But I think the trick is, my, my deal is if you're going to uh, have a, an artistic life, you want to um, totally engage with the thing you're working on. Believe that it's the best thing ever. It's going to answer all of humanity's questions, you know. Bear down on it, do everything. Then as soon as you're done, let it go. Like, eh, it's all right, you know. Then So you're constantly resetting your clock to basically the place it was when you were 18 and all of your artistic life was ahead of you, you know. Uh, that way you get the full benefit of your concentration and your intensity, but then you don't get caught in that trap of being attached to what you've already done. You know, you, and you meet older artists like that, like, back when, when I wrote this book, you're like, dude, that was 80 years ago. You know? <laughs> so I think the trick is to keep the freshness, um, which maybe is, is another way of saying this thing about the uh, writer-reader connection. If I'm thinking about how good my last book was or my reputation or something like that, then I'm not really talking to you. I'm talking to me. But if I'm like, okay, we're still in this crazy world that we still don't understand, can we put our heads together here and talk about it a little bit uh, in the form of a short story? Then I think it's just better for everybody, you know. You've touched a little bit on fears of failure. It seems mm -hmm. like that's one of the biggest things that people, especially young people, um, fear the most. Sure. How have you overcome your obstacles and what were the greatest? ones and getting to where you are today? Well, I think part of it is not, I think it's not that you overcome your fear of failure, but you start to tr think of it as a gift. You know, like if you're, if you're throwing a party for somebody, you don't want to throw a stupid party. Uh, that's how, that's the basis on which you work is, well, let's, let's not make this party stupid, you know. So I think um, to have too much fear is a killer because then you never start. Or, or if you have too much fear and you try to do something artistic, uh, or write a magazine piece or do an interview. You have too much fear. Um, for some reason, when human beings are fearful, they get analytical and they get safe. So they do everything the way they should, which is a recipe for artistic disappointment. You know, if you set out to do what you, if you do what you set out to do, you kind of bum out everybody. You know? mm -hmm. So too much fear is no good. But if you don't have any fear, then you just type some shit up and call, call it a book, book, you know? So, so I, I think, think the trick is not, not you, I don't think you ever get rid of your fear of failure. You never get rid of your ambition. You probably never get rid of your kind of your ambient self-esteem, whatever it is. But I think that an artist is somebody who takes those things and then makes friends with that. Like to say, okay, I'm afraid of failure. Am I a bad person? No. That's part of you. 
So can you get your fear of failure to work for you a little bit? You know, that, I think with my students, I do a lot of talking about how, you, you know, by the time you're 20, you, you're who you are. You, you know yourself very well. You know the way you respond in different social situations, all that. Uh, I think we all go through a period where we think, oh, I don't want to be that person. Let me, let me eradicate that person and replace her with somebody new. I don't think that works. But what maturation means, I think, is you say to yourself, okay, I accept all those weird things about you. Uh, all of my tendencies and my habits can come out, and I'm going to teach them to play nicely together. So that's how you become a mature person, and it's also the way you become a mature artist, I think. You know, it's almost like never saying no to yourself, but sort of saying, yes, uh, okay, I'll use this tendency, and then through my work, I'm going to refine it a little bit. So it's kind of like a, it's a little self-helpy, but it's, it's a way of, of uh, self-acceptance and combined with self-improvement, I think, if you do it right. So is that how you combat writer's block? It certainly is, yeah. Because right, I heard uh, this great writer, David Foster Wallace, said writer's block is always uh, a case of having stupidly elevated expectations. So you think, this is going to be the greatest, and you type the, and you go, oh, it's terrible. You know, so... <laughs> the way to get around that, I think, is to say... Well, actually, the way to get around it is to become good at revising your work. Because, you know, if somebody said, your whole artistic career depends on this story, nobody can function under that kind of pressure. Uh, but essentially, if you don't revise your work, that's what you're saying, is I'm going to write it once. If it's no good, I'm, I'm getting out a new house and going somewhere else. Nobody can, even the greatest writers in the world can't function under that. So what I figured out was, if you become skillful at working with your own text, then you could type some ridiculous, stupid thing, not panic, and start revising it into shape, right? So that way, no matter how bad the first draft is, you don't panic. You just go, yeah, all right, that's stupid. But there's one line in here I like. And, you know, so I think people who have writer's block usually are people who haven't learned to revise. Uh, and it's kind of it's weird. It's almost like if you, um, I don't know, if you're in a relationship and the first time there's an issue, you break up with the person. Mm. Well, you're going to have 300 of the same relationships until you're 90 years old. But if you learn, if you get into it, you, you say, yeah, this is a little bit of a problem. I think I can work with this. Then suddenly the relationship improves, and you don't have to abandon it. You can actually make it better. You know, so I think that that's how I think of a a work of fiction. Even now, I have a story at home that's not that good. It's kind of I've been working on it two months. It's, um, I get a little panic thinking about that, and I think, no, man, you know how to revise, so <laughs> so you can go home and work with it and, and make it better. In your Booker Prize-winning novel, um, Lincoln and the Bardo, and in your Syracuse commencement speech, congratulations, by the way, you deal with the theme of regret. Mm -hmm. Is regret something that you think about a lot, and do you think it's an important emotion? I, I don't think about it a lot, but I, yeah, I think it's kind of important, because in a sense, what it's just retroactive honesty. You know, you get through a day and you go, what, what, that, what did I do that was good and what did I do that was bad? Um, I think there are people who, you know, they, they overvalue the regret part, and so they're always beating themselves up. But I think, um, you know, at this point in my life, to look back and go, okay, now really, which parts of your, my life were shining and I, I'm so happy about, and which parts do I wish I could do over? Then at that point, you have a decision. If, if you say, oh, yeah, that was a bad year, you know, I shouldn't have done that or whatever, uh, you can just feel bad about it, which isn't productive. But you can make a resolution, and you can say, as I did in that speech, you know, I, uh, I don't, I made so many. Uh, my life has been kind of a comic novel, like so many dumb mistakes and weird situations and blunders, you know. And um, I, I feel kind of fond of all that stuff. The, the neurotic Western, you know, Amer American thing to do is to use regret as a form of ego indulgence. You know, I'm so bad. I'm so bad. Okay, you're bad, but get off the couch, you know. So, so as, as you know, many things we've talked about today, you, it's sort of like the middle path is usually the best one to have regrets and step up to them, but at the same time, don't let them, you know, reduce you to a, a sniveling neurotic. Put that on a bumper sticker. Don't. <laughs> and also during that speech, you talk about periods of high kindness and low kindness. Could you give examples of those periods in your life? Yeah, it's mostly, I, for me, it's mostly just a feeling. Like there are times when, um, for whatever reason, the self recedes a little bit. You're, you're just not quite so, um, I guess, fearful, anxious. Uh, it's a subtle feeling of being 
it's hard to talk about without being corny, but a feeling of actually being interested in how other people are doing, uh, which I would call love. You know, the, um, It's also, when I feel that way, I have more confidence in the idea that what I do is important. Like when I'm feeling not that, I feel like it doesn't matter what I do. Nobody cares anyway. And then when I'm in the high kind of feeling, it's like even a, a coffee shop is full of possibilities to be decent, you know? Um, so for me, the trick, and it's weird that it's only now I'm really thinking about it, but do we have any control in whether a given day is a high kindness or a low kindness day? And I think the answer is, yeah, we do. Then the moral life would just consist of making sure that every day you try to do the thing that puts you into the, the you know, the high kind of, for me, the meditation is a big one. Um, although lately I'm noticing exercise is like a weirdly helpful thing. Uh, and most of all work, if I'm writing, I, I, um, I think through writing, I get kind of a renewed interest in the world around me, and then when you go out, it's still active. So suddenly, uh, you actually see dozens of stories and characters walking around, and you have this opportunity to interact with them. You know, so that's kind of nice. But I, but I think it's not. You know, we um, I was raised Catholic, and I think one of the things that I picked up from that, whether they mean it or not, is that you're born good and bad, but kind of fixed, like you're a fixed entity. And the only way to get out of that is to die and go to heaven, hopefully, you know, or repent or something. Or, uh, and I like the, the more Eastern idea, which is that you're born a multiplicity of things. You're a, you're a, you're a hundred different people. You know, you know, you you you've been them and you recognize them. Uh, your identity is fluid. Your ability in a given situation to act virtuously is fluid. Um, so then it becomes very urgent to think about. All right, given that I'm a mess, you know, kind of this fluid mess. Uh, is there any way that I can sort of make it so that statistically I'm mostly the kinder person, you know? Um, the answer is yes, but the other answer is it's hard, and harder than I thought, you know? I'm like 300 years old and I still haven't got it yet, so, yeah. And now with homecoming around the corner, I'd like to talk a bit about Syracuse University sure. as you spent a significant part of your life here. Um, what were your best memories from your time as a student here? Well, for me, the best one, I got engaged in three weeks. when we, my, my wife was a year ahead of me, and we met, and it was just like, you know, and so we looked up, and three weeks later, we were engaged, and it was this time of year fall, and it was a really deep kind of lush, you know, heavy leaf uh, color fall. So that was really sweet. And I remember being in the middle of that and thinking, my life is changing forever, you know? I never thought I'd get such a nice person, <laughs> you know? And so that, that really, every fall I remember that, you know, that feeling of, of um, you know, when you really fall in love, uh, it, it's, things speed up, you know, and they also kind of slow down. And just that sense of almost like destiny, like I'm not in control of this exactly, but is exactly the, you know, the right thing to do. So that, that's a pretty good memory. Um, Gosh, so many. Well, I remember seeing Raymond Carver, that same, you know, the great American short story writer, just briefly in the uh, Killian room at the Hall of Languages. And just, I'd come from Texas and I'd been reading his books at a distance and he was just like, you know, like, like Shakespeare to me, you know. And then suddenly to find yourself standing next to him was kind of a weird uh, thrill. And then probably, you know, really, um, as I walk around campus, what I love is the, um, you know, 20 years of memories of interacting with all these talented young writers over the years and just kind of go, oh, this is where... Cheryl Strait and I had this talk, or this is where Keith Gesson and I were arguing about this, or whatever. And that, that makes the, uh, the physical environment very rich, all those years of memories. And how has SU changed in your 20 plus years teaching here? Well, it's gotten prettier. That's one thing. You know, because you know, a lot of places that were road, they fixed. Um, I think, I'm not sure. I mean, the one thing I've noticed is that the, um, I think the thing I love about Syracuse is it's a it's a big university, but the ethos is small universities. So uh, I've heard so many stories of students saying, you know, I was going through a rough time, and somebody in the administration or faculty noticed and helped me. Or you see somebody come in a little lost and confused, and um, somebody on staff will really uh, talk to them like family, you know, which I think I, I've come to value that more and more. And in our program, the creative writing program, we have a nice small... Uh, we, we let in six fiction writers a year and six poets, and we have enough money to fund them 100%. So it's the same feeling of kind of a family uh, that's about some pretty serious business, but we don't, it never becomes institutional. It's always, uh, and there's some competition, but it's kind of under control. So I think it's like the ideal uh, situation in which to teach writing, so I really value that a lot. And now with all of your accomplishments, you've won a MacArthur Fellowship, the Booker Prize. 
It begs the question, what are you still doing here? Why do you, why do you stay and continue to teach rather than solely focus on your own writing? It's kind of selfish because it, I, I'm a little superstitious. Like that all the, the success has come from exactly the regimen I'm in now, which is teach, um, feel like, oh, why can't I write? And then you get to, and there's like four days of bliss, you know? So there's something about the routine that I trust. And also, I think... Um, for me, there's something really lo lovely and lucky about uh, getting to engage with young people, you know, the, the talented young people, and, and kind of to be reminded that talent is not, it, talent is totally eternal. Every generation has it. And now when you get to this age, you tend to go, oh, all the talent died in 1982. <laughs> no. And so t teaching just reminds you that, it, it, of course, it's going to take a different form in every generation. It has to. But to be in contact with that is really electrifying, and it does kind of send you back to your own work with um, renewed respect for it and, and ambition. You know, so I'm, I, um, I think it's mostly I just recognize that this place and my colleagues and my students are totally intrinsic to what I've been able to accomplish, uh, and I don't at this point see that putting that behind me would be helpful at all. You know, that's really so it's selfish, <laughs> just pure selfishness. Well, thank you for staying here, and thank you for being here today. Thank you for being here. You're a wonderful interviewer. Thank, thank you so much. You. Really a pleasure. You've been watching an interview with the great George Saunders. I'm Claire Miller for the News House.